Hello, I'm Scott Sturgill with the UW Nutrient and Pest Management Program, back with you again to discuss soil micronutrients. And this topic is, again, another uh, topic in the series of CCA pretest training videos that we're shooting. You remember from the earlier presentations, we classify soil nutrients in three general terms, the macronutrients, N, P, and K, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, the secondary nutrients, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. And now we're going to discuss the third category, which is soil micronutrients, or which are the soil micronutrients. Uh, micronutrients found in soils that are important to crop production are listed here on this, this slide here. You'll see boron, chlorine, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, molybdenum which is always difficult for me to pronounce, nickel and zinc. <clears throat> for the most part, in Wisconsin crop production, we're concerned about three micronutrients, and that would be boron in alfalfa production, manganese in soybean and small grain production, and zinc in corn production. And we'll talk about these in greater detail and look um, at some of the deficiency symptoms in a moment or two. Uh, micronutrients do serve an important role in the plant. However, they're required at very small amounts relative to our macronutrients and our secondary nutrients. So uh, we need to be aware of them, particularly if we're dealing with a crop that has a high requirement for a given not, uh, uh, micronutrient, but uh, not to the extent we do of the, of the big three. Uh, we also need to be aware that too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, and certainly with some of the micronutrients, uh, excessive concentrations uh, can harm plants, uh, and we'll look at those situations as well. Conditions or red flags that could lead to a micronutrient deficiency in a crop production system. Uh, one, the most important would be unique demand levels of specific, specific crops. We need to know what the demand is of the crops we're growing for a given micronutrient. And you, this is a table that it comes out of the A2809 uh, Nutrient Recommendations publication from UW Extension Soils Department. Uh, highlighted here in red and high is, <coughs> excuse me, the major crops and their need for a given micronutrient. <coughs> excuse me again. Alfalfa, you can see, has a high, high need for boron, as we talked about zinc for corn and manganese for soybean. You can see some of our other crops and their needs for the major micronutrients. If you're involved in managing some specialty crops or vegetable crops, please be aware of whether they have unique micronutrient demands. Um, you can find that out through the literature and also by looking at A2809. And again, be aware that some of our specialty crops, as you see here, do have unique micronutrient needs. Secondly, if we're dealing with, uh, I call them abused soils or extremes in soil conditions, those would lend themselves to micronutrient deficiencies or at least have higher potential for micronutrient deficiencies. By extreme soil conditions, I'm talking about pH that's out of whack, either too low or too acidic or too high or too alkaline. <clears throat> also, our um, soil texture extremes in soils uh, are prone to micronutrient deficiencies. Our sand, <clears throat> excuse me, porous soils and our heavy clay soils can also uh, be prone to micronutrient deficiencies. Organic matter content. If we're very low in organic matter content, we could have multiple nutrient problems, and one of those could be with some of our micronutrients. Too high of soil organic matter can also lead to some micronutrient deficiency symptoms, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And also, if we're dealing with soils that have lost a lot or all of their topsoil due to soil erosion, uh, they could be compacted or other abused soils, as I cause you, anything that could limit crop root uptake, these also would, could be prone to micronutrient deficiencies. Extremes in weather conditions, uh, too dry, too wet, uh, too cold, uh, these also can cause some of the micronutrients to be um, <clears throat> deficient, or at least ex crops to exhibit nutrient deficiency symptoms. Chances are when uh, conditions, crop conditions, soil conditions return to normal, either through uh, rainfall or when the heat finally arrives in the growing season, these micronutrient deficiencies will disappear. Manure. Manure is the source of all things good. And typically, if a field has a manure history, there oftentimes is not a micronutrient deficiency or need on these soils. Uh, where manure or other organic additions to the soils have been uh, 
Um, haven't been present for a few rotations there, we might increase our susceptibility to micronutrient deficiencies. How do we diagnose our micronutrients? Well, for the ones we're most concerned about, boron, manganese, and zinc, we have soil tests that will evaluate uh, and look for the optimum level of, of these uh, nutrients in the soil profile. Some of the other micronutrients, copper, iron, molybdenum, chlorine, and nickel, um, plant analysis is done rather than soil analysis. When to apply micronutrients? Uh, there's a preferred and a practical uh, technique for assessing the need for micronutrients. One of the one of the main criteria we have to look at is do we know that the crop has a high requirement for a given micronutrient? For example, corn with zinc, boron, and alfalfa. Then we look at our soil test levels. If we are able to measure, uh, if there is a soil test for the micronutrient in question, is that low? Then uh, we know we're probably going to have an issue. We can confirm the issue <coughs> by observing deficiency symptoms on the plant, which we confirm with plant analysis. There's a problem with this last step because this last step typically occurs too late in the growing season to correct a problem. So a practical technique for assessing the need for micronutrients in crop production is to know <clears throat> that a crop nutrient requirement is high. And if we know the soil test for that is low, uh, we better be aware, be preparing for applying some supplemental micronutrients. So micronutrient deficiency symptoms and the susceptible crops and soils, uh, we'll talk about boron, boron and as first. And as I mentioned, that is the most common micronutrient deficiency for alfalfa and other forages. Um, it is the most commonly uh, widespread micro deficiency in Wisconsin cropping systems, as a matter of fact. Uh, the susceptible soils, boron is a negatively charged uh, cation and um, Low organic matter soils, sandy soils, don't hold a lot of it. So sands and, and organic matter soils, low organic matter soils tend to be low in boron. Also dry soils, the ability of uh, boron to get into the soil solution and being uptaken by crop roots is, is lower uh, if we're dealing with, with dry soils. Once these soils get adequate precipitation or irrigation water, uh, the boron deficiency simply uh, typically goes away, but we need to be aware that dry soils are more susceptible. We diagnose boron with uh, soil tests. We have optimum levels that are illustrated here, uh, levels for sands and levels for other soils. The deficiency symptoms for boron uh, in alfalfa, we're looking at a yellowing or chlorosis of the top or the newest leaves. Boron is not mobile in the plant, so if we're going to have a deficiency, it's going to show up in the new growth rather than the old growth. Uh, because it's not a mobile nutrient, it won't translocate from old growth to new growth. Um, you're going to see shortening of the inner nodes, a bushy look on our forages. The forage is going to be, the alfalfa is going to be smaller than a healthy uh, or bat boron adequate crop. Um, with alfalfa and other forages, if we're going to see boron deficiency, you typically see it after the first cutting, particularly if we have dry soil conditions following that first cutting. And we want to make sure that we don't mistake in boron deficiency uh, for leafhopper injury. They tend to somewhat look the same. Here's a slide that illustrates uh, boron deficiencies in alfalfa. On your left, you'll see a healthy alfalfa plant. On your right, you'll see a boron deficient alfalfa plant. Notice the chlorosis, some cases the reddening of the leaves at the top of the plant, the new growth. Also notice how this plant has shortened inner nodes or a bunching or bushing appearance. That's typical of boron deficiency. Here's another shot of boron deficiency where you'll see the white or yellow bleached appearance of uh, new leaves on the alfalfa plant. Please don't confuse boron deficiency with potassium deficiency. You saw these uh, if you reviewed the potassium uh, video we put together. Potassium is chlorotic, chlorotic dots or white dots at the tip going down the margins. Also this horrible picture shows leafhopper. I'm sure Brian Jensen in his video showed you better uh, pictures of leafhopper burn, but don't confuse this with boron deficiency either. <clears throat> in some extreme cases of boron deficiency, not only do we see the yellowing or the paling of, the, of the, the, the new leaves on the plant, but there also can be a reddish cast that's sometimes observed. And this is a photo from Iowa State that shows that reddish cast in alfalfa associated with boron deficiency. <clears throat> 
Corrections for boron deficiency, if our soils are testing optimum or higher, there's no need for boron. If our soils are testing low or very low, we need to broadcast boron. Um, uh, if the crop has a high requirement, we're looking at a higher rate of two to three pounds of boron per acre. If the crop has a medium boron requirement, we're looking at a rate of one to two pounds of boron per acre. We suggest that you broadcast boron applications. Do not band or uh, in row apply boron. Boron can be toxic in concentrated amounts to corn and soybeans. So broadcast applications of boron are, are what is preferred. Manganese. Manganese is the most common micronutrient deficiency for soybean and small grains and, and snap beans. The soils where we're likely to see manganese deficiency would be our high pH alkaline soils, greater than 6.8, our high organic matter soils, greater than 6% organic matter, and also our red clays of eastern Wisconsin and cold, wet soils in general. Um, if our soil organic matter content is less than 6%, we diagnose uh, levels of manganese in soil with a soil test, as I talked about earlier. If we are dealing with high organic matter soils, which are greater than 6%, their soil pH is the parameter we're concerned about relative to the uh, availability of manganese in the soil. Symptoms for manganese deficiency. Again, these symptoms are going to show up in the newest or the youngest leaves because manganese, uh, like boron, isn't mobile in the plant. You're going to see inner venal chlorosis. You, uh, the veins of the plant will stay green on a given leaf, but the area in between will be um, yellow or faded out. You also see stunted growth and occasionally in really bad situations leaf drop of our soybean crops. In our small grains, uh, there's a condition called gray speck disease that shows up in oats and barley. Uh, manganese deficiency causes these spots that occur on the, uh, the leaves of the grasses here, oats and barley. Another shot of manganese deficiency showing you the intervenal chlorosis. And two more shots showing again it's going to be concentrated on the younger uh, top, uh, leaves on the top of the plant and extreme intervenal chlorosis here. Uh, a wider angle view of a soybean plant that's adequately fertilized for manganese and one where manganese was not applied on a soil that needed. You see the stunted smaller appearance of the soybean crop. So again for soils that are high, testing optimum or higher no needs, need for manganese. For soils that are testing low uh, if the crop has a high or medium need, remember we're combining soil test levels with the need of the crop, you can apply three to five pounds of manganese per acre. Uh, it can be, uh, manganese should be applied either um, in row or band applied, but not broadcast applied. Manganese can very quickly be tied up uh, with the soil, and if we broadcast it, uh, we can tie it up and make it not available to plants. So we need to concentrate our manganese applications in that soil so the roots can get them. So in row or band applications of manganese are preferred. Foliar applications can also be applied and you can see some typical rates here for addressing deficiency symptoms in, in soybeans. Zinc. Zinc is the most common micronutrient deficiency for corn. Um, we we'll also occasionally see it in snap beans and some other specialty crops. Uh, susceptible soils are the high pH soils, uh, the alkaline soils greater than 6.5. Soils where we've lost organic matter, eroded topsoils or compacted topsoils. Sands and uh, high organic matter soils can also uh, immobilize the zinc or not hold on to the zinc. Cold wet soils and there's some research conducted by Iowa that seems to suggest that uh, high soil test phosphorus levels and high off phosphorus applications have the ability to tie up zinc. Um, we're not absolutely certain this has occurred. I don't believe we've seen this in Wisconsin, but there is literature, particularly from Iowa, suggesting that this can be a concern. Zinc levels in our soils are diagnosed with soil testing, and you can see the optimum level here of 3 to 20 parts per million for all our Wisconsin soils. Uh, deficiency symptoms. I got some photos that will come up in just a second, but zinc is unique where in corn you'll see broad bands of bleached tissue that run parallel to the midrib and to the leaves and they show up on the newest leaves again. Uh, it begins at the base of the leaf and heads out to the tip. 
Uh, there also can be stunted growth of a crop or corn crop that's deficient in zinc, uh, shortening of the inner nodes uh, in corn, rosetting in our broadleaf crops, which result in smaller leaves and uh, shorter crops than we would expect. This is a photograph of zinc deficiency in corn. You can see these broad bleached bands I'm talking about that originate from the base of the leaf out to the tip. Here's another example, again borrowing some images from our friends at Iowa State University, an extreme case over here. And uh, this illustrates the inner node situation. On the bottom here is a normal healthy corn crop or corn plant that has been adequately fertilized with zinc. Up above is one that's deficient in zinc and you can see the shortening of the inner nodes along the stalk that have occurred. Zinc deficiency corrections. Uh, our soils are testing optimum or higher. Response to zinc is highly unlikely, so we don't need to worry about it too bad. If uh, our soils are testing low or very low and the crop has a high need for zinc, such as corn, uh, we can either band apply zinc or broadcast apply zinc, and rates are shown here. Foliar applications of zinc are also applicable. We've got to apply these at lower rates, and with foliar applications, you may have to go out there more than once to apply the amount of zinc that the soil test recommendation suggests you need to apply. Other micronutrients, copper, chlorine, iron, molybdenum, uh, nickel, we don't worry about them uh, too much, if at all, in Wisconsin. They're rarely, if ever, seen in Wisconsin's agronomic crops. We may see some of these deficiencies in some of our ornamental or horticultural crops, but we're focus focusing on egg crops here. Chlorine, nickel, deficiencies not seen. Copper, you can see some of the crops that have a high need for copper. In Wisconsin, we're probably more worried about copper uh, toxicity than we are, are worried about deficiencies. Uh, it's more of a problem on our, or can be more of a problem on our sandy soils. Uh, copper gets applied to these soils through fungicides in the potato and vegetable industry. Also, copper shows up on dairy farm soils. Uh, copper sulfate is a uh, foot bath treatment and can lead to elevated levels of, of soil copper. And extreme levels of soil copper can cause toxicities for some crops we grow in the state of Wisconsin. Um, it takes a long time to draw down soil copper levels because um, soils or crops don't remove much of it and it hangs in the soil profile. Uh, iron, I put this in here just because I, I love the, uh, these, this picture. I think uh, it looks, looks cool, but rarely, rarely, if ever, do we see iron deficiency on our Wisconsin soils. Uh, iron deficiency is more common in western Minnesota, the Dakotas, and the farther west you go on the, into the Corn Belt. You're going to see iron deficiency on high pH alkaline soils, but rarely do we see it in Wisconsin. So to summarize our micronutrient discussion, micronutrient deficiencies are rare in Wisconsin. Uh, you as a CCA or crop consultant need to be aware of the crops you're growing. Does that specific crop have a high demand for a given micronutrient and which micronutrient is it? Uh, be wary of our susceptible soils. You know, you've always got to use some caution if you're dealing with sands, heavy clays, if we have pH at extremes or very low, very high organic matter. As I mentioned, unusual weather during the growing season can cause some of these micronutrient and other nutrient deficiency symptoms to show up. And you know, if we suspect the micronutrient deficiency, we need to confirm it, you know, either with soil testing, with visual signs, or with plant analysis or tissue testing. So again, thank you very much for your time.